to see Judith. And I'm recording. Here we go. <laughs> now we go. <laughs> no, it's such a treat to see you, Judith, because the pandemic has kept us separated for a couple of years now, right? It has. I was in New York a year ago, and um, we saw each other then, and that was um, that was, you know, a big deal because the pandemic wasn't really over, but we haven't seen each other for a long time. And I'm so grateful to Chevaliers and Cyan for hosting us tonight. And, you know, there's so much to talk about your book, my book, but what we thought we'd really start off by talking about is our very long friendship. Um, I was counting um, this afternoon thinking it was over 40 years ago yeah. that we first met. Yeah. And when we talked this week, we had kind of different memories in a sense of um, how that happened. I, at the time, I, my partner, I had met a wonderfully witty, smart Englishman named Digby Wolf, who was a writer and I had moved to LA to be with him. And your partner at the time was Bert Nodella, who had been one of the producers on Get Smart. And we also uh, knew a wonderful, remarkable man named George Slaughter, who was the producer of Laugh-In. And those three people, you, had boats at the marina. And I had moved to LA in the mid 1970s from Idaho, from Sun Valley, Idaho, because I wanted to be a writer and I wanted to be around people who were doing what I wanted to do. And that's what I remembered is all those wonderful weekends we had together on our boats, which were lined up together on a slip in the marina. And um, you and I bonded instantly. Yeah, uh, th they were identical boats. They were Digby's both boats in your boat, right? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And and Digby was living on his, and Bert and I were living on mine. But my first memory of you is when Digby had said, "You've got to meet my new love in Sun Valley." And so we were going skiing there, and uh, and we met you then, and you were a 20 something year old, absolutely gorgeous ski instructor to the stars. <laughs> and um, we oh. talked about books then and, uh, and you said that you wanted to be a writer. And uh, I thought, well, that's nice, that's lovely. And then you wrote me a letter soon after that. And the letter was so, uh, so incandescently beautiful. I remember where I was sitting when I was reading it. That's the impression it made on me. And I thought, she's already a writer. And then you came down to LA and then you spent time learning to write on your own. How did, and you had your own little writing room at Digby's house or something. How did that work? Digby was wonderful. He was the head writer on Laugh-In. And by that time, just like Get Smart was a kind of iconic um, series in the 70s, so was Laugh-In. And um, Digby was the head writer on Laugh-In. And um, of course, um, he had come to Sun Valley to learn how to ski. And through a connection, I had ended up giving him private lessons. And we fell in love and I moved to LA to be with him. And he used to say to me, you just go in that room and write and I'll take care of everything else. Mm -hmm. And it was such an extraordinary gift because really I had this deep desire to be a writer, but I hadn't gone to college. I had not gone through, you know, um, an academic life. And I knew that I was going to teach myself to write. And the way I was going to do that was to read and read and read and to study the writers that, you know, I really admired. But it was really Digby's belief in me that I could be a writer that, that made so much difference. 
And from the time I met you, one of the things we bonded over was our love of reading and our love of books. And I think as long as I've known you, I've always also felt that you were always writing and that you had this side to your life that was rather private. You were a public person. You'd become very famous um, from that original series, Get Smart, even though you had a very rich life before that series and a very rich life after that series. But I feel that it was books, books and the love of reading that um, really made us such close friends in part. Yeah. And that, that love of reading starts in childhood, I think. Did you have certain books that you read as a kid or did you ever have like an epiphany saying, oh my God, that is, this is amazing between these covers? It's interesting because I grew up in a household where we didn't really have books except religious books. Yeah. And I don't remember my parents ever reading books to me as a child. They weren't readers. I discovered some books when I was a, a teenager that meant a lot to me. But it wasn't until I was about 18 or 19 that I really discovered um, literature, great writers, Thomas Hardy, D.H. Lawrence, Henry James. And when I discovered those writers, I said, oh my God, that's what I want to do. Yeah. I want to tell stories. And really at the time I met you, I was trying to teach myself to write. And from the time I discovered those wonderful writers until um, I published my first book, it was about 20 years. So I thought it was much shorter than that. I, 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 why did I think it? Maybe it's the myth <laughs> that I thought it was five years. I know. I, know. And I was 39, 40 when I published my first uh, collection of short stories in 1988. In 1989, I published The Chinchilla Farm. And I discovered a voice. And my wonderful editor, Dan Frank at Pantheon, with whom I did five books, used to say to me, it's your voice. That's what I respond to. And that's what I always look for in a writer. Yeah. And to make a little bit of a, a transition here, that's what I recognize in your memoir as being so wonderful and so special, is that you found your voice. And, um, I know that you had been writing essays and that you had also published this just remarkably wonderful small book in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. a nonfiction book called Living Alone and Loving It, yeah. which came out of your experience of understanding how you can make such a meaningful, remarkable life as a single person. And when I saw that you were doing a reading of Book Soup in LA, I hadn't seen you for a number of years. That's right, I remember that. And I came to your reading. I don't know whether you remember that. I do remember it. It was on Sunset Boulevard, right? It was actually, oh, it could have been Book Soup, but I was thinking that it was Chatterton's or, um, anyway, it was just a wonderful reconnection that we made 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, so if I may, can I talk a little bit about your memoir um, to start off? Okay, we'll take turns then. <laughs> we'll take turns. We decided that our books are really quite different, but in many ways they have real connections. Uh, a love triangle, a friendship, that involves some kind of betrayal or complication, a marriage that has mysteries and that in many ways was challenging. One book is fiction, one book is nonfiction, but I, I'm happy to admit that I don't think I've ever written a book in which I've drawn 
more completely on my own life. Um, and I went back to using the same narrator, Verna from Chinchilla Farm, who picks up the story 30 years later. So I went back to that same, same voice. Yeah. But when I asked you, could you describe your memoir for me? You wrote this really wonderful paragraph, which I'd like to read. I wanted to tell the story of coming to New York City to be in show business and meeting a glamorous Frenchman who I married only to discover he wasn't the person I thought I'd wedded. Tucked into that adventure were others, negotiating the white water of relationships during the 1960s, playing Agent 99 in the TV series, Get Smart, and the learning curve of becoming an independent woman. I think one of the most wonderful words in that description is the word adventure. And that's really what your memoir captures, is this really extraordinarily adventurous life. And it's one that you look back on with such generosity and such kindness. I would love very much to be able to talk about your marriage to the Frenchman, Lucienne, but at the peril of, really, of, of, of revealing what is really such an extraordinary story, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say that it forms this wonderful cohesive core of a memoir in it it takes place at a pivotal time in your life and uh, in the 1960s when you met Lucien and the way in which your life was transformed by that marriage that remarkable marriage and also by your um, your role in Get Smart, Agent 99, which was just such an extraordinary series written by Buck Henry, who has said that you were just wonderful. You were uh, remarkable and you really were. I watched some of those episodes recently and I had my headphones on and I found myself just laughing out loud. My husband was sitting on the sofa looking at me. It was incredibly witty. When you think it was written by Mel Brooks and Buck Henry, and that it was meant to be this spy spoof, and that as Buck Henry described it, it was as if James Bond and Inspector Clouseau had a child. That's right. It must have been so much fun to do, wasn't it? It was fun, yeah. I mean, doing a comedy is always more fun than doing a dramatic show because you're laughing a lot. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't watch the show. I never watched it much after we did it. But occasionally I'll run across uh, an episode and, um, and I will laugh out loud too because I've totally forgotten them. I've forgotten everything about them except the wardrobe. <laughs> which I got to keep. <laughs> the wardrobe, which I would like to mention, you were such a mod icon. The clothes you wore on that show, I don't think that meant, I think that there are things about you that's, that are so unknown. Um, I'd like to talk about a little bit. One of the things was that Andy, you were kind of an inspiration for Andy Warhol, who did this spread of you in this, these remarkable mod clothes for TV Guide, along with the cover in which he had done for silk screens of you. Uh, that must have been quite remarkable. Um, um, yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, I think I wasn't so much amused as the commission that he got <laughs> for doing it. TV Guide commissioned him to do that. But yeah, uh, yeah it, it turned out to be the most, um, the most sought after uh, cover of TV Guide ever, and it's not thanks to Agent 99 so much as it was with, you know, how famous Andy Warhol had become. Mm -hmm. Well, the journey that you've made from Pittsburgh, you always wanted to live in New York, you moved to New York, you became a model, 
You also briefly were a showgirl. Um, and something that many people will discover in reading your um, memoir is that while you were a showgirl, I think at the Copacabana on some kind of lark, the uh, Times printed a quiz and the showgirls were asked to take it and you had a, like a perfect score, which led to you being asked to be on the $64,000 question uh, and winning the grand prize um, yeah. and your specialty was Shakespeare. These are kind of small events in the, but they led to very big events in your life in terms of being cast as Agent 99 and going on to have um, uh, amazing adventures. But I think that what your memoir also shows is an extraordinary uh, ability to tell a story, a really wonderful story. And I guess one of the questions is, how long had you thought about writing this memoir? Well, the memoir itself is it's thanks to you <laughs> because um, I had tried to write it as a novel. I wrote a 360 page novel based on that story, on the story oh, of yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it didn't work. And then I pared it down to 200 pages. It still didn't work. And then I, I just put it away. And you and I were having tea at my apartment a few years ago. And uh, you said, whatever happened to that story? And I said, that's history. And, and you said, well, I think you should just write it in, in, as you, just write it in your own voice. And since I really love the story, um, I did it. And that was actually because of your encouragement. And the other, in, uh, the other way you influenced that book is that um, I, once I had written it as a memoir, um, I couldn't make the structure work, you know, and I, I knew it wasn't working. And again, we had a conversation and you said, um, I have this friend, you know, Eli Gottlieb, who's a marvelous writer, by the way, and teaches at Columbia. And he takes private students and uh, in not, I mean, private commit, you know, he, he will coach you through a book. And, um, and he turned out to be a structure wizard. Um, we, it, he just, in, in one session, he said, here's what has to happen. <laughs> you know, here's what's wrong. Um, and so I took out a third of the book and I wrote another third and um, under his guidance. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the speed of the book, the fact that it pops along so nicely is yeah. because of what I learned from Eli and, um, and that, that uh, stems back from you as well. Well, it's really true. Eli is a kind of a, a, he's not only a beautiful writer with many novels to his name, but he's, he's just a wonderful editor. And that that worked out so well is yeah. so evident. I want to just show the book because it's such a wonderful cover and it's such a beautiful book. And I've marked some passages. I wonder if you could read um, read something for us. Um, we chose a couple of passages, but anything you'd like to read. Okay. Um, it, yeah. Uh, there's this one that uh, one of the sections of the book is uh, I wanted to uh, introduce people to what it was like to be on the set during a, a day of shooting. I was sort of inviting people to watch what happens. And this is just um, uh, a small, oops, I've got the wrong one, uh, a small uh, section of that chapter. Breakfast arrived just as we were called on set to rehearse. My hair and curlers, the director blocked the scene and back I went to eat cool eggs and let the hairdresser fuss over 99's bangs, which were 50% of her character. 
Then off to my dressing room, a trailer placed on the soundstage for convenience, where the wardrobe woman was waiting to dress me in 99's mod clothes. It was eight o'clock, the shooting day began. The stand-ins, our patient look-alike, stepped away. Don and I stood on our marks. A buzzer sounded, red lights flashed, the director called action, and we became Max and 99, which was effortless for me because Don's energy was like a rocket blasting off with me attached. It was fun. Comedy's rhythm, as much music as it is prose, delivers a sort of uh, emotional helium. Cut was shouted. Pumped with adrenaline, we stepped aside. The camera was checked and either we would go again or moving on was announced. And in a great shuffle of activity, camera, lights, and sound equipment were dismantled and moved to another set. Now began, now began my main job, waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sort of debunks the glamor of that chapter of the glamor of shooting something. Waiting, waiting. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'd like to say a few things about your book, Judith, Fair is Fair, right? Okay, let's move. Um, first of all, I, 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 it was interesting to hear you just say that you were, uh, this book was based very much on you because I did notice that she wrote one of your books. <laughs> and you, Verna, your, your, um, Mm -hmm. protagonist uh, mm -hmm. wrote the Raymond Chandler book, right? Mm -hmm. Am mm -hmm. I right? Okay, uh, these right. are, there are a few, my reaction to your book was so emotional. As you know, uh, after I read it for the second time, actually, and it really deserves to be read, to be read more than once. Um, I called you, uh, I, I was so emotional and I, I, and luckily you couldn't speak, you were in the car. And uh, so I, because uh, I was just choked up, I couldn't even talk. It was so touching, so profound. And I, I, I was just so moved. And, um, but there were many things in the book that led up to that reaction. Um, the first thing that I, that I love, not only in this book, but in all of your books, is the beauty of your writing, of the way the sentences flow, the tone, the ease, the, the music of it. And then it's what you do with words. It's description so intimate and uh, so minutely observed. Um, there's a passage in uh, the first part of the book um, where you're describing um, a winter storm coming in and it's before uh, she leaves uh, the West to come to LA. And you're describing a winter storm. It's in a very remote place. And you wrote, a storm had come in and the wind sounded like a woman sighing, pitching her tiny granules of frozen grief in sudden bursts against the window panes. Oh, I mean, it just buckled my knees. It is so beautiful. And it's that kind of, that, that it's that magic that you can do with words. And it's also the simplicity of your writing at times where it's just, it's just your calm demeanor, just as you are on this, you know, on, on this appearance. Um, and it makes it so easy to be with the narrator as it is easy to be with you. Uh, she's such good company. I never am bored. I never get tired of her. Um, I could travel with her. Um, and it was also fascinating to be in her head as she's dealing with this really long and very loving marriage, which is suddenly in crisis. And as she manages, and <laughs> manages is a good word for it, um, a poignant trip uh, through the West with a childhood friend uh, who I could not travel with actually. Um, and I loved that you made this simple triangle of characters. Uh, each one is so extremely different 
from the others that you think that they could never possibly coalesce emotionally. And when they do, and they do, it feels like a blessing. There's Jolene who's fiery, transgressively expressive and a political free spirit and, and Vincent who is just the opposite and emotional minimalist. And then of course, Verna finding a balance in herself and becoming herself in, a, in the course of the book between these two extremes. Yeah. I was so touched by your compassion, uh, not only for your human characters, but for, for the land, because the land becomes a character in the book. The West um, becomes so, so visceral, so vivid. Um, and your description of how this beautiful place and the passages um, about those places are so exquisite. And I want to, I'm going to ask you to read one in a minute when I uh, just finish these other things. Um, that you, you show how horribly scarred the, our country has become, the, the beauty of these lands has become. Um, and it, it was great the way you used MacArthur Park uh, to show the effects of our culture and the fallout of that, um, that created homelessness. And in general, the, the book is so kind. I think I, I, that touched me more than anything. Uh, kind, not only to its characters, but a kindly concern for, for the country, for the land, and uh, which is somewhat wounded, as you show. I love the ending, which weaves together um, with forgiveness and redemption and, and such grace that it made me weep. And that's when I called you. <laughs> oh, and I love Jolene and Vincent's book list. We have to talk about that. <laughs> okay. I just thought, so, you know, at the end of it, and I, and I just thought, what a beautiful tribute to that 20 something year old ski instructor I met years ago who dreamed of becoming a writer. It was just lovely. I'm um, very touched. Now, would you read that uh, something from the trip through the West? Sure. Um, I should just say that Jolene and Verna were born in the same small town. They were childhood friends. They reconnect when they're in their 60s. And Jolene asks Verna for a favor, which is to take her back to the small town in Utah where they were born. And um, it's a two-day drive across the Great Basin through Nevada, a drive that I've made so many times, going back and forth between Idaho and LA. And I never tire of that amazing, huge, empty, beautiful basin and range landscape. We crested Black Rock Summit over 7,000 feet and dropped into a valley and came to an old stage stop with a rotting log cabin and dugouts carved into the hills. The vestiges of a settlement from the 19th century. An old corral was made of boulders and rocks that had been stacked into a large circle. No trees out here to make a post and rail corral. The road became curvy winding beside a river with cliffs like black claws, casting jagged shadows over ravines. White patches of ice lay against the banks of the river. I thought Jolene might wake up as I braked and turned and the car swayed around the sharp curves, but she slept on. I felt sorrow when I gazed at her, not pity, which she never would have wanted just sorrow, she looks so frail. I passed more animals that have been killed on the road and there were lots of them, especially rabbits, all lying in various states of decay. 
black clutches of crows fed on the kills, pulling at the carrion with their fierce beaks and waiting until the last minute to fly up and out of the path of the car. We passed Duckwater, nothing more than a falling down old motel and a few abandoned buildings. The motel looked like many of the places where I had stayed with my family on drive through the West. Motels with the carports so you could park right next to your room, like the motels Humpert Humpert had stayed in with Lolita on their drive through the West. These were the kinds of motels Nabokov and his wife had rented while he was writing the novel and that he had loved. He once said that the principal invention of the American West was the motel. Now many of them were abandoned or had become rundown places that rented rooms by the month to workers in the extraction industries. The once festive neon signs had gone dark, the clever names, a reminder of another time. Lovely. Uh, also, when you talk about the, in the book, about the landscape, there are so many landscapes and you found just endless ways to describe them. I, uh, the, the, your language resource is huge <laughs> and appreciated. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, in almost every one of my books, the landscape is so important. Red water, the story set in the 19th century. And I often think writers think that we make all these things up or that readers think we just it's all our imagination. It is some recall and it's imagination, but it's also just looking at the world. Yeah. And when I was teaching writing, I used to say to my students, just look out the window, look at the way those leaves are moving in the wind. You know, look at the light on something, look at someone walking by, because everybody, when they read a book, a novel, a memoir, they want to have a, a sense of place. They want to have a scene that they can enter. And for me, my love of the West goes so deep. It goes back to my childhood. Um, when, you know, my mother and father would take us on long drives from Utah to Arizona to visit my grandmother. And we would pass Zion and Bryce and the Grand Canyon, drive through the Navajo Reservation, um, stunning scenery. And I think it just became so much a part of my interior life mm -hmm. and it's sucker and it's solace still to drive through that landscape, which I just did again. Um, it's very important to me. And this book, I also wanted to talk about how that landscape has been used for nuclear testing for all sorts of dumping of toxic and chemical waste uh, as bombing ranges. So at one point, you know, Verna and Jolene are passing through this area of Utah and there are dozens of uh, waste disposables, millions or hundreds of thousands of acres that have been just um, left off limits um, that are being used uh, essentially um, for practicing warfare. Um, so there were a lot of things that I was able to bring into the novel that I'm thinking about a lot, whether it's guns, war, evictions, homelessness. Um, these are threads that run, you know, underneath the book. But I feel like this book, when I say it's close to me, it's also a kind of culmination of so many things that I've been thinking about. Uh, one of the one of the threads to the book, and a big, big, strong one, is how women relate to men, yes. and how women use men to complete themselves. And I think that's a major theme. You and I talked about that the other day. And yes. um, I think you had a passage um, 
about that? Am I right that you were going to? Um, I, I think what I mentioned to you was that Verna is very aware of the way that she was raised. She was raised in Utah in a, a Mormon family as I was. And it's a strongly patriarchal religion in which women are taught really to obey their husbands, that their husbands hold the priesthood. And so they literally have the direct connection to God and sort of set, set the tone. Um, but I think the other thing is that um, girls from a very young age in that culture are groomed so that they can understand how to be if they want to be wanted. And I don't think it's unique to that culture. I think women of our generation felt that it really was through marriage and a man that they would complete themselves. For me, I got married at 17, the day after I graduated from high school. Um, I knew that I wasn't going to go to college. Um, I knew, I thought that would be my way out. But I think I also was very aware I was marrying a man who already had a master's degree and that he was going to go on for a PhD. Whereas I would have none of those opportunities. And, and um, I do think that for most women from our generation, the idea was that marriage and a man would complete yourself. And I think in both of our books, part of the trajectory, um, as you put it so succinctly in your description, is that how do you become an independent woman as you have done and been for so many years? And for Verna, how does she achieve independence still within the framework of a marriage? They're, they're very different trajectories in a way, and yet both involve um, a great deal of self-examination. We've both gone through therapy. You more than I, I think, very seriously committed to therapy as a way to make the kind of discoveries that you wanted to make. Me, less in a committed way, but certainly when I, I needed that kind of help and illumination, it came at the right time. Um, what was that experience like for you? Because now you, you, you have lived um, independently for a very long time. Um, and yet you have the most vibrant circle of friends. Um, I should say one of the other connections is that Verna loves to sing. You love to sing. And you have been part of a group that meets once a week for many, many years to sing. Um, yeah. I you've made a rich life. Um, I think, first of all, uh, to get back to the first point of, of how women became so convinced that they had to be completed by a guy, you know, that they weren't enough. Uh, started, you know, way back in time and is only recently, now that women have an opportunity to make some money. Um, in my book, there's a passage about that, about the difference between my mother and me, that uh, she had no choice. I mean, for her, um, actually, I'm looking at this page, um, I, it, having no path to fortune, the most shiny asset a woman could acquire was a man. It was good policy to keep her asset happy, to polish it, to support it in every way, because her security depended on it. Without this asset, she was bankrupt socially and financially. And then I go on to describe all of the ways that my father, I mean, all the adventures were his, his adventures, that, um, that he went fishing, she went fishing, he had an airplane, she got in the airplane. Um, and and uh, he, he got a speedboat, she slammed through the surf with him in a panic. But then at the end of it, I say, in the meantime, she put her musical gifts, uh, her, her, she put her musical gifts on a shelf 
uh, her piano skills, her trained contralto voice, because, because music didn't interest him. Um, not that he made her give it up, he never had to. She willingly narrowed her interests to his, and that's what women do. Uh, mother was born to this role, just as her mother had been, sacrificing her judgment, her will, her autonomy, and muting those occasional inner voices whispering, wait, this feels wrong. So, yeah. but, but she didn't have another path. You know, when it came to my generation, uh, especially maybe not right at the beginning, but later, um, we were able to branch into other, uh, other businesses. And we didn't just either have to be a secretary and a nurse and a school teacher, but we, we could, you know, do something that would give us a quality of life that only a man could give before that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that that's part of, must have been the reason that you wrote Living, Living Alone and Loving It, is because you really um, had come to that place where you, unlike your mother, unlike my mother, that you were able to see that you could create a very beautiful life as an independent yeah. woman. If, if you have, you know, it, it was hard work at the beginning, <laughs> but... You, you have to work at it like a job to, to create a new family, a family of friends and to have enough of them because they have a strange tendency to disappear into other states or other countries or die or whatever. Um, but um, it's not that I think it's a better way of life at all. It's just that I have not found someone that would be compatible and make me as happy as I am living alone. I mean, he would have to make me happier than I am living alone. And that hasn't happened, but it isn't a second rate life. It's an absolutely first rate life. It's just different. There's so many things that we wanted to talk about, including yeah, our, at the list. our various reactions <laughs> to Los Angeles. Yeah, um, LA, oh my God. You're living in Los Angeles, my moving to Los Angeles, the great challenges we both found in that city, your return to New York, which is your, where you always wanted to be and where you've made such a remarkable life. Um, I'm sh maybe there are some people out there who have some questions for you or for me. We can keep talking, <laughs> yes. not, but I'm, I can't say how much I admire your memoir for the beauty of the writing, for the bravery in telling the stories. But if you think that my memoir in the end was able to resolve itself with a great deal of compassion. That's exactly, I mean, my novel, that's exactly how I feel about your memoir, that it is so generous and it is such a wonderful story. Plus it has some really, really beautiful photographs at the end um, that chronic, can chronicle the different stages in your life. Yeah. It's a remarkable story, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both so much. This has been a delightful talk. I mean, we, we so we we do have two questions already. If we're okay to start those, um, we have a question from Anna, who is in Brazil right now. Uh, Anna says, "I already ordered the Getting Smart memoir, and I'm looking forward to reading it. Uh, I have a question for both of you." I would love to know what is the biggest challenge uh, with writing a book for, for each of you. You go, Judith. Um, I think the biggest challenge, I love when I'm into a book, it's very exciting. And I, I get up in the morning and I go to work and it's not as though, um, it's not an enjoyable experience, but I think the biggest challenge is that you have to give yourself every single day the confidence that what you're doing is working, that 
you are telling a story that is relevant and that you're going to be able to complete. And I think one of the hardest things is simply continuing to have the faith every single day that, that you can do this. You can, you can write this book. Yeah. I think the hardest part is when, when you first start writing, because every word you write is not golden. You know, <laughs> and so the way I write is just I just spew a lot of stuff out on the page and kind of it's sort of like when you are acting at this kind of that technique improvising. It's where you just are. You, you don't you don't edit anything. You just blah, 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 just reams, of blah, blah. And then you go back looking for something worthwhile <laughs> or that you think is worthwhile and uh, piecing it together. And the first part is so much fun because it is so free, you know? Uh, and the second part is so much fun because it's like putting a puzzle together. And the editing part, the, the polishing part is, is, is equally as enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Anna, is that Anna Victoria? I think it is. It Brazil, might be. From Brazil? Mm -hmm. Okay, hi Anna. <laughs> Anna and I correspond. We also have a question from Michelle. Do you find that things happen to you that you're pretty sure wouldn't have happened in your life if you if you did have a man around? That's um, a good question. Oh yeah, that's to me because you do have a man around. So, um, I gosh yes. Uh, the first thing I discovered was um, when I began traveling alone, I, I wanted that, but that was just a big, exciting challenge to go to Europe alone or to go to South America alone, which I did. And what I noticed is that I was never alone. You know, there were always a family or somebody who, who was, I have hiccups, <laughs> somebody who was in the restaurant. Um, and I found that I made more contacts with other human beings because I was traveling alone than I ever did when I was traveling with a partner and it, we were a fortress of two focused on each other. And when you're alone, you open the door and there you are and you can meet all kinds of people. That's only one thing, but <laughs> yeah. are there other questions? That yeah, we also have a question from Kevin says, do you remember Mary Brown? Don't know who that one's for. If you don't, then go to the next one. I, yeah, it was pretty vague. I don't know. <laughs> That's the only information. Uh, we also have Maria, uh, who's in Peru right now. I've got a question for Barbara. Do you have plans to write more books after getting smart? It's getting smarter. Um, I, I, to say a book is such an ambitious thing. I mean, this, this book was a book because it has a big central story. I love to write essays. I don't think essays are very, I don't think they're published very often, you know, especially for somebody who doesn't have a reputation as an essayist. But with the internet now, you can put your own things on, you know, you can write an essay and you can post it and then you have people who will read it. Maybe more people will read it than would read it if you published a book. So um, I'm not thinking in terms of a book. I mean, if that ever happened, a collection of them, fine. But um, I just love doing them. And um, yeah, it's like making cookies and giving them to your friends. <laughs> We also have a question from Claudia. Uh, Judith, are you working on a new book? I know MacArthur Parks didn't come out that long ago, but. <laughs> yes, I'm just starting a new, a new project, a new book um, with a photographer, Tina Barney, who I've known almost as long as I've known Barbara. We took a trip to India together in 1991 and uh, I kept journals and Tina took photographs. And somehow this is the moment when we are now going to make a, a book out of that journey. So I'm going back to my journals and that's my next book, the India book with Tina. 
Awesome. We also have a, a comment and a question from Sally who says, um, they just finished reading MacArthur Park and I believe all, all of your other ones uh, and each is more masterful than the previous one. For, for Barbara, what, what point in life did you decide to turn writing as a serious endeavor in the way that Judith has been writing forever? Um, I, I, I have always kept journals. So writing was just something I did every day, always. And then I went through a period when I was in psychoanalysis, I began writing poetry. And uh, for 10 years, I wrote every day, I wrote poetry. I didn't show it to anybody because it was so personal and so dark actually, but I loved, uh, I loved the compression of it. I loved polishing it. Uh, it was a great joy to me, but then analysis, psychoanalysis worked and I no longer had those dark things that needed to be put in that form. <laughs> so I began writing prose. So I'm sort of uh, addicted to just putting a pencil on the page or tapping on the keyboard. Um, it, and I don't know that I was ever like seriously serious about it. I never presumed to be, honestly. Um, but then living alone and loving it, turned out really nicely and and then I loved writing this book and um, I'm very happy with it and my ambitions are pretty much um, you know satisfied We've got another one from Sally uh, Barbara I was wondering if there was a moment you realized that you had crossed the Rubicon from actress to mod pop influencer. Were you at all uncomfortable with that shift? Um, looking back, would you have done anything differently? Uh, to, uh, you mean crossing it from acting to what? Being, being like an influencer because you became like such an icon at the time. Like even as an actress, you became kind of like an image of a, like a mod pop. Okay, so this is from a, a, a lovely young person, right? <laughs> because the influencer did not have any, it, it, it didn't exist. It, the influencer as a word in the dictionary, I'm quite sure it did not exist when I was an actor. So, huh? <laughs> like superstar or like. It's like what, I'm sorry. Like superstar, like icon. Like, yeah, I think icon's probably the. Oh, oh. yeah. The, I, Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that seems a little lofty for Agent 99, but um, like when you're doing a series, you're not aware that anybody's watching because you're on this soundstage and it, it's just the same old guys and the same old blue jeans every day. And uh, you do your job and you go home. It's like a factory in a way, in a very sweet family kind of way. And um, so that you don't have a sense of yourself as anything special. Uh, although I don't think that's true of all actors, because I've met a few, <laughs> a few who thought they were very, very special. But um, uh, it, it's, uh, I never, th I, I never, I, I, it's just foreign to me to think of myself like that. Can I ask you something, Barbara? How important was it I, for you to keep acting? I know you did many things after Get Smart. Um, you know, I. I how important was that to you? I, I was doing a pilot one time after Get Smart, and I always hoped these pilots wouldn't sell because it would be like five years again. And I was standing on the set, and I thought, would I rather be doing this or reading a book? And the answer was clear. I would rather be reading a book. So for the natural, you know, the, an actor, especially a woman actor, uh, has a certain length of career, unless you're a character actor. And, um, and that's not what I was. And, uh, and, and so uh, you expect that it's not going to last forever. And, uh, and in the meantime, if you're fortunate to have the right advice, you develop other things that interest you equally, if not more. And that was the case with me. Yeah, you know, I never felt a great hunger or a great need for uh, uh, that kind of career. In fact, 
what I felt from you was a great curiosity, um, a, an enormous curiosity and an ability to just take so much pleasure from life, find so many different interests. Um, and, and that's just, I think that that's made for a very rich and wonderful life. Yeah, I think people can get trapped in a career, you know, and get trapped in saying, well, I did this before, uh, that's what I wanted to do when I was younger and I should always try to keep that going. But, you know, we, we mature out of things, not just in age, but we mature our persons, our interests mature and something that we thought was quite magical at one time, but later on we think something else is better. You know, we started out talking about how books um, help to really solidify our friendship. And I remember when you finally moved back to New York, which is where you really belonged. LA was also always kind of an anathema to you. That uh, um, I remember at that point, I sent you Rilke's letters to a young poet and it became a book that was important to both of us. And that was probably early. I don't know, when did you move back to New York? 1980? 1977. 77. Yeah, 77. Uh, the time I went to LA, you were leaving LA. And what's interesting is that maybe we can sort of conclude with is that it's still such a big part of our friendship. When we call each other and we talk to each other, what are you reading? Yeah. yeah. What am I reading? The essays of Montaigne that you might be reading, but what's been interesting in lockdown is that we've both been reading Proust, right. um, Remembrances of Things Past. You you've completed the journey. I'm halfway through. But when we realized that, um, that we both had, had decided to sink into Proust, um, that, that, that was really terrific. Th that was a nice fallout of the pandemic because it was an opportunity to take on these, what I call big books yeah. and, um, and really devote ourselves to them. You know, yeah. with no distraction and, and like you don't have to go back two chapters to see where you left off, you know. It's just, you just keep going into that world and living in that world and you just think nothing, nothing in life is better. It's true. So Chevalier books, Cyan. Thank you, Cyan. Thank you, Barbara. Thank, Thank you, Judy. Mentoring <laughs> us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'll come in and visit you when I come to LA, whenever that is. That would be lovely. We would love to have you. And Judith, I think we'll, we'll probably have you back pretty soon, right? How long are you going to be at I'll go back and forth. So I'll see you soon. See you soon. Okay. okay. Thank you all so much. Have a good night and evening. Thank you. Bye.